Lord Evening Book Talk, um, which is made uh, possible uh, through a generous gift from the Ford Motor Company. Um, uh, Ford has been a great friend of Mount Vernon for many, many years. Um, and before we get started, I did want to tell you about our next uh, Ford Evening Book Talk will be taking place on May 18 here in this room, um, Beauty and the Brain, um, The Science of Human Nature in Early America by Rachel Walker. Um, and now to introduce tonight's um, guest speaker. Um, Benjamin Karp is professor of history at SUNY Graduate Center in Brooklyn, New York. Um, his research focuses uh, particularly on urban politics, society, and culture in 18th century America. He's taught survey and seminar courses in American military history to 1900, colonial American history, revolutionary American history, women in early America, and fear and violence in early America. He's the author of Defiance of the Patriots, the Boston Tea Party and the Making of America, which was published by Yale University Press in 2010. Um, and it won the Triennial Society of the Cincinnati Cox Book Prize in 2013. He also is the author of Rebels Rising, Cities and the American Revolution, which was published by Oxford University Press in 20, uh, 2007. He's also written articles for Colonial Williamsburg, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. He joins us tonight to discuss his newest book, which you see here on the screen, The Great New York Fire of 1776, A Lost Story of the American Revolution. So please join me in a warm Mount Vernon welcome for Benjamin Carp. Thank you. It's it's really a pleasure to be here in this room with all of you. Um, you know, I've been giving book talks for the past few months, uh, and a lot of them are on Zoom. And I don't know if you've ever heard the expression like a tie in hockey is like kissing your sister, right? Like sometimes giving a Zoom talk is also a little bit like that. Um, so uh, you know, the ability to kind of commune with an audience um, is is really, really nice. And so I, I really want to uh, express my appreciation, um, well, to our hosts, uh, but also to you um, uh, for, uh, for being here today. Um, so, okay, right, we're at Washington's house, um, and I'm gonna make you decide for yourselves today whether George Washington burned New York City. Um, <laughs> okay, so on September 15th, the British captured Lower Manhattan, uh, uh, leading to a kind of panicked and somewhat embarrassing retreat by the American troops. Uh, September of 1776 is a, a time when the American cause was not in a good place, right? And we're talking, you know, six to eight weeks after the Declaration of Independence, or, or eight, eight to 10 weeks after the Declaration of Independence, and it's not looking good for the survival of this baby United States. Um, anyway, so the, so, uh, so, the, uh, so, the American, so the British have taken Manhattan, and then six days later, this devastating fire begins, and I'll, sh I'll show you guys some more about how, how devastating this fire was, uh, that burned about 20% of New York City as it existed at the time. So this is a story about the American Revolution and about George Washington that we don't usually tell. And I'm actually gonna be uh, very, uh, doing a little bit of a variation on my usual book talk and spending some time today talking about why you probably haven't heard this story, or if you've even heard of this event, why you've heard of it as being something historically not that significant. Um, so, uh, so this book is going to, it probes the mystery of this singular and relatively unknown moment in the American Revolution, this fire on September 21st, 1776, that destroyed a fifth of New York City. Um, at the time, revolutionary Manhattan was basically the center of the revolution, the center of this violent and uncertain civil war, the center of a factious process of making a new nation, and, the, uh, you know, and at the center of this clash of armies who didn't always behave with the highest standards of behavior and committed a bunch of what we might now call atrocities, uh, 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 both sides, right, during, during the course of this war. And so one of my big question, obviously, with this is who set this fire? Um, and most historians have either kind of thrown their hands up and say, no, we don't know, or they kind of believed the story that the American leadership and the Patriot press told, which is that the fire was a mere accident, not really worth thinking about anymore. And I don't necessarily agree with that. Now, um, so I did not know that this map was actually, a reproduction of this map was on the wall behind you. Um, 
<laughs> uh, that's the full size version of the Blaskowitz map, which is one uh, I, I saw it uh, on display at the New York Historical Society. It's one of the most beautiful pieces in the Robert H. Brown collection. Um, uh, but if you really zoom in, right, if you if you if you see most of the buildings in New York City are a nice, uh, you know, pinkish color. And then there's that gray area. That is the area of Manhattan that burned. Um, and on that map, it actually looks like m possibly more than 20% of the urbanized part of New York. But if you're familiar with New York City, you know, there's not much north of City Hall Park, right? We're talking maybe 4,200 buildings uh, in New York City at the time. The rest of Manhattan Island was rural. Uh, nevertheless, New York City with its 25,000 people, that made it the second largest town in the 13 colonies. Uh, Philadelphia was bigger. Uh, New York City's not gonna surpass it for a, a few more decades. Um, so, uh, so if you look at a map like this, it looks like that gray area is contiguous. And so if you believe the story that it was an accident, that the fire began on Whitehall Slip, right, where the Staten Island Ferry leaves from today at the tippy tip of the island, right, and that the wind was blowing really strong in a certain direction, right, you figure lots of wooden houses covered with wooden shingles, um, you know, this is called flaming brands. If you've ever seen videos of the Paradise Fire in California, you know that in dry conditions, wind can pick up a flaming branch. Uh, I actually talked to a fire scientist in Kentucky, you know, and we talked about talked this out a little bit. Um, can pick up flaming brands, uh, and those can hit the roofs of other houses, and uh, you, you know, and you can have a very extensive accidental fire. Uh, 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 through that. And uh, and New York City was particularly vulnerable to fire at this moment, having been occupied by the American army since April. Then the American army evacuates, and now it's been occupied by the British army for six days. They're not in a very good position to fight this fire. Most of the civilians had fled. Many of the firefighters had either joined the army or were out of town. Um, the bells had all been removed from the churches to be melted into cannon. Uh, and so there's no late night warning system to be like, fire, fire, everybody get up and join bucket brigades. You know, you pull on that bell pole and there's nothing there. The, the, the bells were all gone. Um, uh, and a lot of the firefighting equipment had kind of fallen into disrepair. Uh, uh, so uh, so New York City was really not in a good place to uh, fight a fire. And so if if it was an accident, if somebody knocked over a candle and a, you know, and a shed caught fire, it could be that this whole thing was uh, was nothing more than that, that it spread fast via the wind and these flaming shingles. And, you know, and if that's the whole story, we could kind of say, well, isn't it terrible in wartime, disasters like this happen? Maybe we could see some of the effects on social conditions in New York, and that would be pretty much the story uh, that we could tell about it. But what if this fire was done on purpose? This is the most famous image of the fire. There are a few different variations on this image. Um, the ignore the architecture. This image was done by a German engraver living in Augsburg on the basis of British newspaper accounts. <laughs> and so, um, so actually he's getting some of the stories right because the British newspaper accounts were from firsthand witnesses and they, they describe, you know, uh, you could see a guy being bayoneted to death and you can see, you know, uh, British soldiers having encounters with people who are trying to set New York City on fire. Uh, obviously this German uh, person was very obsessed with the presence of black people on the streets of New York City. There's not a ton of evidence from that from the uh, written accounts, but you see that in this image as well. But this image clearly seems to show, and by the way, right, um, these images were designed to be lit from behind. And so these flames would have glowed at you uh, if you went to see them on display somewhere. Um, so it's really interesting to kind of think of this from the history of, of print in that way. But anyway, what, what this image is showing us is a deliberate fire. Um, and I want to say that making the case for a deliberate fire requires a certain amount of what history dorks like me call contextual knowledge, right? The first thing you have to know about is strategy. Um, strategically, the burning of New York City made sense. Now, let's bring it back to George Washington. The British Army is already in Staten Island. He's got a force of about 40,000 soldiers and sailors about to descend upon him, the largest amphibious force that anyone had seen in the world in a very long time. Uh, Washington probably has about the same number of men, but he's trying to defend an archipelago at the mouth of the Hudson River, and he's got to keep his guys spread out. And, uh, and he's facing really superior naval capability. And so Washington essentially has three choices. He can stand and fight. This is what a lot of the public and his soldiers want him to do, because of course, um, you know, the, uh, you know, Washington ends up having to retreat from Long Island, you know, on September 15th, they retreat from lower Manhattan, right? This, like, well, you know, the, the Continental Army is relatively new and it kind of seems like ever since they 
um, you, you know, the, the, the British abandoned Boston, right? All we've done is retreat, right? Uh, uh, you know, so he could stand and fight, but if he does that, he's almost certainly going to get outmaneuvered by the British and he will lose his entire army either to surrender or being killed. So that is not a great choice. He's coming to the conclusion in consultation with his generals that he almost definitely has to, has to leave. But in leaving, he also still has more, two more choices. He could leave the city intact or he could burn it behind him. Classic tactic in warfare, scorched earth, right? If you think the enemy could use a bridge, you burn the bridge, right? Um, Washington could burn the city of New York on his way out. Um, and, uh, you know, General Nathaniel Green recommended this. Uh, uh, his adjutant general, Joseph Reed, recommended this, right? Burn the city, uh, you know, uh, let, let's not leave it for the British. This will be our strategy. And I'll talk about that in a, a little bit more in a second. The other thing you have to have a little bit of contextual knowledge about is you have to know something about soldier discipline. Um, this was the British vision of what uh, New England soldiers during the siege of Boston were like. Um, but if you read the literature of a lot of American commanders, including George Washington, this was kind of their perception of a lot of the American soldiers in 1776, too. Um, Washington calls them, a mo uh, just in like August and September of 1776, he calls them a mob. He calls them disorderly. He calls them raw and undisciplined. He calls them unsoldierlike. He, uh, he, he says they're engaged in shameless uh, ravages and other kinds of mutinous behavior, that they're cowardly, that they're little better than highwaymen and robbers. This is Washington saying this, um, that, that uh, you know, he's asking Congress for new articles of war because he thinks these soldiers need to have greater fear of physical punishment. So it's like, wait, uh, you know, I can only use the biblical limit of 39 lashes. You know, in, in the British army, they get 1,000. Can you up it maybe to 100 for me so that I can actually like uh, instill some fear in these guys? And so he's, you know, he's outraged um, uh, by his own troops. And in addition to that, there were rumors and threats throughout the summer um, from May 1776 onward that if, uh, and, and then especially after the British win the Battle of Brooklyn on August 29th, that as soon as the Americans are obliged to retreat from New York, that the American army will set it on fire behind them. Now, um, and, uh, and and so Washington has to hasten to assure like the New York state legislature that these rumors aren't true, that he's not just given blanket authorization to his troops to do this, but the legislature is like, hey, we've heard this rumor that any man is authorized, to, I'll, I'll read this in a second, to set it on fire. He's like, no, 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 anyway, I'll get to this. But, um, but the other alternative that I'm interested in is maybe these disobedient, deserting rebel soldiers would have been willing to burn New York City in defiance of their, of their officers. So that's another idea that I want you guys to maybe consider. But one thing that we really have to understand is what were Washington's discipline problems in 1776? There are some more famous mutinies in the American army in 1780, 1781, 1783, but 1776 is also a pretty mutinous army. Uh, and that's not something that I think even most historians appreciate. And then finally, I think you have to know something about the wartime conduct of both sides during this war. We have this vision that like, oh, the American Revolution was like kind of nice compared to say the French Revolution or the Chinese Revolu Revolution or the Russian uh, Revolution, but um, things could get pretty ugly during the Revolutionary War. The British had burned Charlestown, Massachusetts, right inside of Boston during the Battle of Bunker Hill in June of 1775. They'd burned Falmouth, Maine uh, in October. They'd burned Jamestown, Rhode Island, right inside of, uh, inside of Newport, which is also on a map behind you guys, um, uh, all during the first year uh, of the war. The British also began cannonading Norfolk, Virginia, the sixth largest town in the 13 colonies, um, and then North Carolina and Virginia militiamen on the Patriot side came in and burned like 85% of Norfolk. However, the American press was able to spin it. So it was that the British had burned Norfolk. Um, and in fact, Washington later says like, oh, this is great. Now, you know, Washington and John Adams and Franklin are like, this is great. Now it's going to convince Southerners that this isn't just a New England revolution. And now we're all joined together because we're so annoyed about the British burning towns. Um, and sure enough, in the Declaration of Independence, one of the grievances against King George III is he has burnt our towns. Um, but and it was really mostly at that point, just those four, um, but big ones. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and in March of 1776, Washington was surrounding Boston and he was ready to invade, even if it meant goading the British into destroying Boston, the third largest, uh, uh town in the colonies. Um, uh, but he and Howe kind of came to General William Howe came to a kind of informal truce and the city remained intact. So, I mean, both sides had this kind of idea that burning towns was kind of an ungentlemanly thing to do. 
yet their allies are still perpetrating acts of destruction. And so that's something that I have to try and work out for readers is what are people's actual attitudes towards destroying towns and cities and destroying civilian people's homes uh, during, during wartime. Um, so what's my evidence for the fire possibly having been on purpose? So unlike the Blaskowitz map behind you guys, this map, which is a pretty rare one from uh, the New York State Library in Albany, actually shows the blocks that were destroyed by the fire as having been completely erased off the map. Uh, so I find these wartime maps of New York City that show the evidence of damage from the fire to be really interesting. But what's our evidence that, um, that this uh, fire might have been, uh, might have been on purpose? Uh, there were combustible materials left by the rebels all over town. Some were discovered before the fire, including trails of gunpowder. Uh, some were discovered during the fire, caches of combustible materials, and some were discovered even months later, like stashed in a chimney, like, oh, it's getting cold enough, you know, in November or something, let's start a fire. And it turns out there was all this like combustible material packed into, the, into that chimney that had been left there since the summer. Um, the fire chief who had just been appointed by the British, uh, he had been a firefighter during the colonial period, a guy named, a tinman named uh, uh, John Baltus Dash. He was so afraid on September 19th, two days before the fire, that the Americans were about to burn the town. Um, and this was while the British were in occupation that he buried his valuables in his yard for safekeeping. Um, on the night of the fire, several witnesses said it broke out in several places at once, two places, three places, maybe even 10 or 15 places, indicating that, you know, separate ignition points would be an indicator of a deliberate fire rather than a spontaneous accident. Um, the British, right, uh, caught several people in the act, either tampering with firefighting equipment or carrying incendiary materials or even holding aloft a torch, setting things on fire. Uh, and in a few cases, British soldiers executed them on the spot, uh, either by bayoneting them to death or actually throwing them into burning buildings. Um, there are three different stories uh, saying that either 40 seamen or eight seamen uh, had rowed over from Paulus Hook, New Jersey, uh, in order to land behind the Trinity Church in St. Paul's Cathedral and set the town on fire. These are contemporary stories not remembered years later. Um, uh, and finally, we have a confession by a spy named Abraham Patton uh, on, uh, in June of 1777. He was caught trying to bribe a grenadier and possibly part of a plot to set new, the British encampment at New Brunswick, New Jersey on fire. Uh, and on the gallows, he supposedly confessed to also having been one of the people who set New York City on fire. And he was definitely a spy for George Washington. Um, and Washington later says to John Hancock, hey, let's get this guy's widow and four children some money, but let's do it privately given the line of work that he was in. Um, so Washington, Washington actually vouches for three different captains in the American army who are accused of having set New York City on fire. So, uh, you know, uh, that's something I'm not gonna go into detail about today, but um, it's another interesting data point that's in the book. Um, so I wanna argue uh, that Americans did burn the city. They wanted to target a British garrison and naval base. They wanted to target some of the wealthy loyalist property owners who had big mansions in New York City. And they wanted to target, for the Episcopalians in the room, the Church of England. Uh, Trinity Church at the corner of Wall Street and Broadway. Uh, the one that's there now is church number three, because this is what happened to church number one. Uh, tallest built, probably the tallest building in New York City at the time, uh, given how it was situated on a hill. Uh, the Reverend John Milner described the original Trinity Church. Uh, he says, the old church is awful and majestic in ruins silently reproaching the infernal monsters, he's referring to the patriots here, whose impious rage had led them to burn Trinity Church. He says, New York City is no more, New York is no more the same city it was. Good God, what a sight. 800 chimneys standing without a house. The old church destroyed, all the suburbs torn to pieces and the remaining houses mostly wrecked. And in another letter, he says, the glory is departed. It's all gloom and despair. The rich have become poor and the poor have become desperate. Um, so what we want to know is, did Washington, right, and this is him with Boston behind him, the city that he had preserved, um, uh, this is a Peel portrait, uh, this is the closest thing that we can imagine to what he would have looked like in September of 1776. Did this guy countenance the burning of New York City? Um, or if not, right, does it suggest some kind of uh, radical faction within Washington's own army? So let's look at what, let's spend some time actually doing stuff with text um, uh, and, uh, and see. I mean, we know the Americans were not necessarily above destroying cities. They thought about it in Boston. Um, they did it at Norfolk. They hated the British for the places they had destroyed. 
Washington has this decision to make uh, in September, and he doesn't want to make it alone. He can try to defend the city, he can retreat but leave it intact, or he can burn it. Um, because there's another military history topic that I can talk about, which is generals' awareness of the importance of politics. Uh, Washington was very good at this. Uh, I took uh, classes at, at the University of Virginia with Gary Gallagher. He always used to talk about how uh, Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant and William T Tecumseh Sherman were all very good at this. They were always aware of the politics and the press in addition to what they had to do strategically, logistically, and tactically to win a war. This was something that Washington was very good at. Washington is very concerned about his own reputation, the civilian bodies who support him, and the constant drumbeat of public opinion, because it is a civil war and he needs these things to win. He has to keep his reputation intact. He has to keep his army intact and supported by state governments through recruitment, through money, et cetera, et cetera. And he has to keep civilian public opinion on his side. So burning a city is one of those things that looks a little risky um, if what you wanna do is preserve your own reputa reputation and keep getting uh, the support of civilians. So on August 22nd, with the British troops beginning their landing on Long Island, one of New York City's deputies to the New York Provincial Con uh, uh, Legislature had transmitted a report to the Provincial Convention saying there is a report amongst the, prevailing amongst the army that if the fortune of war should oblige our troops to abandon New York City, it should be immediately burnt by the retreating soldiery and that any man is authorized to set it on fire. And this was alarming to them. Sure, the city might be doomed, but any man, even a common soldier, some soldier from Connecticut, ugh, you know, could kindle that spark. That horrified them. So to Washington, they write, the convention will cheerfully submit to the fatal necessity of destroying that valuable city whenever your excellency shall deem it essential to the safety of this state or the general interest of America. In other words, hey, Washington, if you're willing to take responsibility, um, we will support that decision. Uh, you're the guy in charge of the military aspect of this. Yet they felt... They had a duty to their constituents, and so they needed to take every possible precaution that 20,000 inhabitants will not be reduced to misery by the wanton act of an individual. Um, you know, in other words, right, some lowly Connecticut private uh, taking matters into his own hands. And so they asked Washington to take such measures in preventing the evil tendency of such a report as you shall deem most expedient. In other words, burn New York City if you have to, but make sure your men are obedient. Um, and Washington did not need this reminder. He's complaining about the disobedience of his church to Congress every day. Um, uh, so he hastens to assure the New York State Legislature, uh, nothing but the last necessity and that such as should justify me to the whole world, right? Remember the Declaration of Independence also talks about speaking before a candid world, right? So nothing uh, uh, except what would justify me to the whole world would induce me to give orders for that purpose. A couple of weeks later, on September 2nd, after Washington had lost the Battle of Brooklyn and retreated to Manhattan, remember, the American army is not in a good place, um, he poses a question now to the Continental Congress. If we should be obliged to abandon this town, ought it to stand as winter quarters for the enemy? The British would derive great conveniences from it on the one hand, and much property would be destroyed on the other. And then he gave a very pregnant warning. If Congress should resolve upon the destruction of it, the resolution should be a profound secret because the knowledge of it will make a capital change in their plans. Now I ask you, if there were a letter in response to this from Congress to George Washington saying, okay, go ahead, burn the city. Do we expect that that letter would survive in our records? I don't think so, but on the other hand, I'm a responsible historian. I'm not gonna argue from a negative and try and be like a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist about this. Instead, I'm gonna suggest, however, that the evidence that we do have you know, sort of says, well, okay, like something clandestine might be necessary if this is what we are going to do. Um, so Congress, in response, gives per Washington permission to evacuate, uh, but a committee of the whole says Congress would have a special care taken in case he should find it necessary to quit New York that no damage be done to the said city by his troops. Now, I'm a professor, right? I say, pass a voice, ah, you know, uh, no damage should be done. Who's doing the damage, right? Um, uh, 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 sorry, I lost my place. Um, in, uh, 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 no damage be done to the said city by his troops on their leaving it. Congress had no doubt of being able to recover New York, though the enemy should for a time obtain, obtain possession of it. Now, they had to know that that wasn't true. The Americans were never gonna have a, a good enough Navy for the Americans to be able to take back New York City by themselves. I mean, Washington fantasizes about this all the way up until the Battle of Yorktown. He's like, 
let me in. I want to take New York City back, right? Like, I, I really feel aggrieved about having lost it. It's, you know, it's so strategically key. It gives you access to the Hudson River, to Connecticut, to New Jersey. Like, it's really annoying that the British are there. Can I please dislodge them from it? No, the Americans do not have the capability of dislodging the British from Long Island, Staten Island, uh, Manhattan, and the other little islands around there. They can't do it. But Congress is expressing every confidence that, oh, don't worry, you can give up New York and we'll be able to safely get it back. Don't, don't worry. Um, so, uh, you know, but in any case, Congress seems to be giving Washington a clear no. They didn't really forbid Washington, I would say, from directly ordering or secretly paying someone to burn New York. They only said to make sure it's not his troops. Make it so that it looks like we didn't do it, I think. Um, you know, keep your men, men disciplined, in other words. This was a reminder that he hardly needed. So, you know, General Nathaniel Green is urging him to burn the city and Rufus Putnam is urging him to burn the city and Washington is convinced, but he appears to have interpreted Congress's resolution as an order not to burn the city. So on September 6th, he writes back to Congress, perceiving it to be their opinion and determination that no damage shall be done to the city in case we are obliged to abandon it, I shall take every measure in my power to prevent it. Um, again, he would try to prevent damage from happening, which I think leaves open the possibility that damage might happen Anyway, it just wouldn't have Washington's name on it. So despite his obliging tone, Washington later confessed in a letter to his cousin, and this is really interesting. All the letters that I've shown you so far have been known very widely to historians since the 1780s. The correspondence between Washington and Congress was published very, very early on, even before the first histories of the revolution were published. But this letter actually, as far as I can tell, was not widely known among historians until John Fitzpatrick publishes it in the writings of Washington in the 1940s. So this letter, which historians can't resist quoting, um, is, uh, is, is, is a, a somewhat more recent discovery. So in his, in his letter to Lund Washington, who is the caretaker here at Mount Vernon, uh, while Washington is out on campaign during the war, Washington confesses, had I been left to the dictates of my own judgment, New York should have been laid in ashes before I left it. And to this end, I applied to Congress, but was absolutely forbid. Um, and, and he says that preserving New York City may be set down among one of the capital errors of Congress. In other words, huge mistake that we left this, this place intact. Then weirdly, a paragraph later, he says, oh yeah, by the way, speaking of New York, I forgot to mention Providence, right? Providence means God here, right? God or some good honest fellow has done more for us than we were disposed to do for ourselves as near one fourth of the city is supposed to be consumed. However, and this is the part that annoys him, enough of it remains to answer their purposes. In other words, the only thing he's really upset by is that more is, is that 80% of New York City is still standing. Um, meanwhile, Benjamin Franklin's secret committee of correspondence, Continental Army officers are also denying that the Americans had set the fire. And if we have time, I'll, I'll get into this a lot more. So what did Washington learn from the fire? In some ways, it's hard to say, right? He doesn't really station his army directly in cities that much anymore after 1776. Um, it, it, you know, he, he doesn't seem as interested in engaging in sabotage campaigns after this. With Native Americans, it's an exception, right? He sends the Sullivan Clinton expedition and they burn 40 towns in what's now uh, upstate New York. So burning Indian settlements was one thing. Uh, but as far as burning towns in America, Congress actually debates like, oh, we should send people to burn towns in England and Scotland. Uh, this doesn't really get off the ground, but it is something that Congress considers. But Washington is basically in charge of what's, you know, what's going on in North America. Um, and he doesn't seem that interested in burning uh, even loyalist occupied places in America that much after that. He, he understands that this makes the young United States look bad. Now, one possibility is just as King Henry II, the, the second one said, it's possible that he said something like, will no one rid me of this meddlesome city? Um, and that his, his officers who were super faithful to him, you know, kind of took the hint and said, all right, you and you, you know, row across the river and burn that city. The boss will be happy about it. But just, you know, if anyone asks you whether you were under orders to do this, you say no. Um, that's possible. I mean, they caught people with their officers' commissions on them. You know, the British caught people with their officers' commissions on them who they said were burning New York City. Captain Richard Brown, uh, who was supposedly captured at the Battle of Brooklyn, but it's possible he was then let out on parole and does this. Um, uh, it's, it's really hard to know. Uh, but it's clear that, um, you know, Washington at least thought it was important to have deniability about this. Whether he did it, as you can tell, I don't have him dead to rights. 
Um, but I'm hoping that uh, you know audiences will read my book, readers will read my book, and and make this decision for themselves. Um, and 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 it, but it, it does suggest an even more interesting possibility to me, uh, which which is also suggested by hints in Washington's correspondence, which is that maybe it was just a, a, a radical faction acting of its own volition within the revolutionary movement that did this. I mean, revolutionary people did not always obey their leaders, right? Some radicals were so committed that they overstepped boundaries, they destroyed tea, they tarred and feathered, they mutinied, they set homes on fire. Um, and so it's possible that the men and women who burned New York City um, might have been defying their own officers, right? Desertion and disobedience had spiked, as I said, during the summer of 1776. And a, a general in the Connecticut militia was actually warning congressional delegates that if staff officers like G uh, General Reed didn't stop disparaging the Connecticut troops, that those troops might start fragging uh, the staff officers. Like I found a hint of this actually like in a bad photocopy in a library in at Los Angeles. And I'm like, wow, like this is not a story about the revolution that we usually tell. I mean, as much as Washington had strategic reasons for burning New York City, the rebels also had further emotional reasons for wanting to burn New York. Um, much of the army is composed of New Englanders who really disliked New Yorkers, especially the wealthy ones, really disliked loyalists, really disliked the Church of England, and, and many of them probably wanted revenge for the destruction of several New England towns by the British. Um, I have a number of imperfect, uncorroborated uh, uh, sources, either from immediately after the fire or from several years later, identifying some of the people who were involved with burning New York City. Some of them, uh, some of these sources mention American captains uh, trying to pin the deed on American officers and therefore by implication, their commander in chief, George Washington. Um, many of them mentioned that it was specifically New Englanders, which made sense given the composition of the uh, army of 1776. Um, one called the first incendiary was a woman who may have been summarily executed by British troops, uh, possibly the first woman of the United States killed by the British right? Uh, given that, you know, the Declaration of Independence had only b b been uh, inked for a couple of months. Um, the, uh, another man was a, a, a mulatto, in other words, a mixed race man uh, who might have been part Pequot, might have been part African American, part of a group of eight Connecticut men, uh, two of whom, including this mixed race man, were thrown into burning buildings and killed. Um, I've also been very interested in a 57-year-old uh, heavy set New York City ca tavern keeper who became a prisoner of war for 18 months, um, and also this Scots Irish spy, Abraham Patton, who I mentioned earlier, who was hanged by the British for espionage in June 1777. And I think that puts together a, an interesting profile of uh, the radical elements within the broader revolutionary movement women and people of color, Scots-Irish Presbyterians, uh, you know, the working class of New York City, uh, you know, uh, New Englanders, right, uh, uh, with their kind of radical religion and, and things like that, that that might have been, you know, some of these were important parts of, the, these were all important parts of the Patriot Coalition, but they may have represented a uniquely radical part that wasn't always willing to do what Washington and his family um, were, were asking them to do. Um, so because uh, we're, we're all here, uh, because of the generosity of the ladies of Mount Vernon, I do want to mention uh, this first incendiary, the lady who supposedly burned New York. Um, a London newspaper reported that the first incendiary who fell into the hands of the troops was a woman provided with matches and combustibles. And this news was meant to shock readers who believed that women belonged at the home front, tending the hearth fires, not at the center of a war zone, starting house fires. Uh, and so to a British newspaper audience, she seemed to be vivid proof that the American rebellion was a kind of crime against the natural order. Um, and this story was partially corroborated actually by two, unprint, two manuscript accounts. First, Henry Strachey, a member of parliament who served as secretary to Admiral Richard Lord Howe in his capacity as peace commissioner, uh, he's standing on board the Eagle flagship and he writes to his wife that British soldiers and sailors had killed five or six arsonists and seized other incendiaries and contrivers. He added, one woman was caught with a match and her hands all over with gunpowder, which she had been kneading into balls, right? This sort of interesting corruption uh, of making bread dough, instead kneading together balls of gunpowder for use in setting New York City on fire. The second account was the 1783 testimony of Private George Kerr of the British Army. Kerr remembered entering a house behind St. Paul's Chapel, which did survive the fire and was a haven of refuge for uh, rescue workers after 9-11. Um, Kerr remembered entering a house behind St. Paul's Chapel where he found five men and a woman. He saw a five gallon keg of gunpowder, more gunpowder scattered all about, and a bundle of matches. He said that the soldiers seized the men, and when the woman cried and offered me money to let them go, 
Um, and she hoped that Private Kerr would kind of look the other way or have pity on her. But instead, Kerr recalled, I took the money and carried the five men, the powder, and the matches to the provost, which was a prison in town. What happened to this woman next? Normally, the laws of war protected women and other non-combatants, but not if they took up arms or acted as incendiaries. And so, back to the newspaper, the newspaper said, her sex availed her little, for without ceremony, she was tossed into the flames by the soldiers. At this moment, remember, the bonds of authority were especially loose. Civic institutions were largely suspended, and the American army and most civilians had fled the city. The British army had only just begun its occupation, and loyalists had only just started trickling back into the city. And this gave license for British soldiers to punish women in ways that they might not have otherwise done in peacetime. Um, and it also allowed Americans to disavow responsibility for the fire. And as a result, this first incendiary was completely ignored by the Patriot press. Now, who was she and why had she done it? Here I can only speculate. If she owned no property in the city, either because she was poor or from out of town, she might not have cared about setting New York City on fire. Since she was discovered in a neighborhood of New York City that was known as the Holy Ground, uh, it's kind of the red light district, um, maybe she was a sex worker, right? Uh, that's an interesting possibility. Or maybe she was, there's a very different image of a woman holding a torch, a politicized New Yorker, a daughter of liberty, defending her hometown, perhaps as a matter of honor. She made the affirmative choice to burn houses rather than let them fall into the enemy's hands. Um, Interesting, uh, 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 a lot of interesting things I could say about this particular painting. Um, and this, by the way, is how Edmund Burke portrayed her when he mentioned her in a speech on the floor of Parliament in November. At a moment of re revolution, women might be admired for their patriotic self-sacrifice, or they might be called monstrous, right? Medusa-like, agents of discord, just as women would be called during the French Revolution or the Paris Commune um, in, in, in later time periods. Um, so, uh, I don't know. I kind of like to give short talks and leave lots of time for Q and A, but, um, if you guys want to hear more about Abraham Patton, I have some good slides about that, or I can get into, um, uh, uh why we don't know this story. Um, I kind of want to leave it up to you guys. Like, um, can I talk a little bit about why we don't know this story? Um, all right. Um, it's one reason is, so I'm going to fast forward through a few slides. Um, yeah, one reason is, is that um, it's murky to begin with, right? Uh, the chaos zone of war, everything I was just talking about, Americans didn't know much after the fire happened because their army was seven miles away from where the fire happened, all the way in upper Manhattan with hills in between. Um, they're on the other side of enemy lines. And this creates the kind of climate where disinformation um, can flourish. And also, the British were also like were also kind of blameworthy on the night of the fire. They arrested a bunch of people, at least 20, maybe as many as 200. Um, and then they held some kind of inquest, but then they basically gave up. Um, it was too hard to prosecute because some of the men changed clothes with one another and so that no one could like re-identify them. Um, the Howe brothers, meanwhile, they are not just the general and admiral in chief. They are also, they also have this peace commission. They're supposed to be reconciling the Americans to their allegiance. So the Howes are not necessarily looking to like string everybody up. They're looking to try and say, oh, well, if you take an oath to the king, we'll let bygones be bygones and you can come back into the family. Um, you know, and so prosecutions on slim grounds that ended in executions would have really worked against reconciliation. They did keep some American officers in prison, a guy named Amos Fellows, uh, Abraham Van Dyke, the, the tavern keeper, but they let, they seem to have let most of the civilians go. They might have been embarrassed that British soldiers had killed a few people on the spot, and they might have decided, okay, those summary executions, that's kind of allowed during the laws of war, but enough is enough. We're not going to have show trials after this on the basis of very slim evidence. Oddly, General Howe kept those records to himself, and the Howe papers were destroyed in Westport, Ireland, in a, an accidental fire, as far as I know, in 1826. Normally, what he should have done was return to them to the Judge Advocate General's office, where they might have survived in the British National Archives. Uh, and then meanwhile, like even the list of people who were imprisoned after the fire in 1776, that was lost at sea in 1780 during the war. So like, there's a lot of records that we don't have that could have fleshed out this story a little more. Now, the British do try and put out their own newspaper version of events. They say the fire broke out in five or six different places at once at a distance from one another. British soldiers and sailors gallantly risked their lives to fight the fire and try and save the city. The Continental Army had waited, they say the Continental Army had waited until the town was depopulated and the firefighting equipment was disarray and the bells were removed so that they, they waited until New York City was really vulnerable and then did it. Plus, 
the British had caught all these incendiaries in the act with incendiary materials on their persons. One was a Continental Army captain, um, but the British also mercifully spared some of the people that they caught and arrested them instead. These facts, this newspaper account said, clearly evince beyond the possibility of doubt that this diabolical affair was the result of a preconcerted deliberate scheme. A second newspaper piece followed up and said that the Americans had long threatened to do this and that any New Yorkers who still supported the rebels uh, ought to learn their lesson and not support these yahoos and incendiaries anymore. Um, and oddly, a lot of Americans initially believed the same thing. General John Lamb called the fire a glorious sight. He supposedly said, let the whole perish rather than the city should afford quarters to the enemy. Dr. Peter Tappan called it joyful news. These are all patriots. Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Hartley said, I hope we shall have intelligence that the rest of that nest of Tories and sink of American villainy has shared the same fate. That cursed town from first to last has been ruinous to the common cause. Uh, Philip Vickers Fithian, a chaplain from New Jersey, says, many suppose it must be New York set on fire by some of our zealous Whigs. Lieutenant Benjamin Trumbull says the city took fire in various places. General George Clinton, who became governor of New York, broke out and it said it broke out in sundry places at the same time. Lieutenant Benjamin Bogardus, New York is a third burnt down. It is said by our own people. A fourth-hand account uh, uh, said, said that General Samuel Holden Parson said it is ridiculous to deny that the city of New York was set on fire, by, uh, 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 by, uh, um, uh, uh, to deny that the, that the rebels had set this fire because it was a matter of general notoriety in the American army that the Americans had done this. Uh, another second-hand story from another chaplain, Israel Evans. Most people in the Continental Army were pleased with the fire and thought that it was done by rebels fired with an enthusiastic resentment. Um, and General Gold Selleck Silliman said, I believe it was not the British regulars, but some of our own people in the city that set it on fire, for they executed several of our friends therefore the next day. But then the Americans get to work. Here's what, the, the, here's what they say from Washington's own headquarters. Adjutant General Joseph Reed, we are quite at a loss. There was a resolve in Congress against our injury in it, so we neither set it on fire nor made any preparations for the purpose. But I make no doubt it will be charged to us. You know, they're going to lie and say we did it. Tench Tillman, Washington's aide de camp. If it was done designedly, it was without the knowledge or approbation of any commanding officer in this army. And indeed, so much time had elapsed between our quitting the city and the fire that it can never be fairly attributed to the army. Washington himself writes to Congress, I have not been informed how the accident happened, nor received any certain account of the damage. To Governor Trumbull of Connecticut, he writes, the British were alleging that they had caught arsonists in the act, but he knew for sure that the British had hanged and burned several people on the spot. And so here he is starting to turn a dangerous accusation against him around. It wasn't the Americans who had burned a bunch of civilian homes and committed an atrocity. It was the British who had committed an atrocity by committing summary executions. You see the little two-step he's doing there? And indeed, several reports from the Continental Army begin putting out propagandistic and, and demonstrably false accounts of the British cutting people's throats, murdering women, Hessians plundering civilians. They even suggest that the British had burned the town themselves and then hanged a bunch of innocent people to cover it up. Um, and, um, and so American newspapers begin saying that the fire had a single point of origin, and American newspapers begin warning readers not to trust British and loyalist accounts about the fire. And the, the most interesting smoking gun piece of evidence that I found was in the Gilder Lehrman connection, a collection in New York. Colonel Henry Jackson is stationed in Boston, and he writes to his friend, Colonel Henry Knox, another Bostonian, Washington's chief artillerist. And Jackson says, I have published in today's newspaper what you desired. And that week, Boston newspapers printed an account emphasizing the inhuman cruelties that the British had practiced during the fire, including cutting throats and Hessian plundering. Jackson reported that the newspaper had done its work. The people here are much alarmed about the burning, hanging, and cutting the throats of some of our people. Um, and a series of accounts from Washington's camp, he said, makes people believe the truth of it. And this account was then reprinted in five other New England newspapers. Franklin, Benjamin Franklin and Robert Morris, who are Congress's secret committee, uh, 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 committee of secret correspondence, they write to Silas Dean in Paris. They say, the conduct of our people will be misrepresented as 10 times worse than reality. The enemy charged some stragglers of our people that happened to be in New York with having set the fire on, uh, city on fire designedly. But the British had, in fact, executed vic blameless victims. They will no doubt endeavor to throw the odium of such a measure on us, but in this they will fail. Washington was too far from the city. He had asked Congress for permission and was denied. And this will convince all the world that we had no desire to burn towns or destroy cities, but that we left such meritorious works to grace the history of our enemies. 
Um, so I, I, I'm going to skip some business about the investigation that the British lost. Uh, I'm going to skip some stuff about how uh, David Grimm told a story that ended up influencing New York accounts for a while. And I want to end with this guy, John Joseph Henry, um, uh, who's from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, became a, 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 ju a federalist judge um, and writes a really interesting account. He actually like um, was part of the, he joined the Canada expedition as a teenager against his father's wishes. Um, he's made a prisoner of war by the British and he gets scurvy, which kind of cripples him for life. Um, and, and he writes this account in his later years um, uh, because uh, he's about to be released from his imprisonment of a prisoner of war. He's on board a British ship in New York Harbor while the fire was happening. And at first he's on this British ship and, the, and everybody on board ship thought that the British had done it, or at least his fellow American prisoners thought the British had done it. But then he remembers he changed his mind as he saw British sailors and soldiers helping to try and put the fire out. And he later concluded that the most low and vile of persons had burned New York City. And he said, it might be that for the honor of our country and its good name, that, you, you, that the, the history books going forward would have to attribute this fire to accidental circumstances. But since the fact occurred within my own view, he was a few miles away, but he could see the fire. Apparently, supposedly you could see the fire as far away as New Haven, Connecticut, um, right? There's no light pollution back then. You could see this fire from miles away. Um, and so he says, it may be well that a nation in the heat and turbulence of war should endeavor to promote its interests by propagating reports of its own innocence and prowess and accusing the enemy of flagrant enormity and dastardliness. But when peace comes, let us in God's name do justice to them and ourselves. And remember that baseness and villainy are the growth of all climes and of all nations. Um, and so I, I want to argue that sometimes when we think about the revolution, we get a little bit too invested in what Jan, the late Jan Lewis called the bedtime story uh, of the American revolutions. Um, and I want to say that there's more complexity to the founders and to the American soldiers, and that we learn a lot more about this period if we can acknowledge that and also incorporate stories of Hessian soldiers, loyalists, British soldiers, women, African Americans, Native Americans, civilians, telling a more global story that stretched from India to Gibraltar to the Caribbean, right? We, we get a really rich picture of the revolution uh, if we allow ourselves to do this. And I hope my book uh, has done something of that. Um, so I wanna leave time for questions. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, if you've got, a, you've got a question, please raise your hand and please wait for the microphone. Um, I see someone up there. Thank you for your fascinating discussion about this fire. In many of the slides, the works were in French. What was, was that common to have so many reports of the Revolutionary War in um, French publications or? Yeah, the, the versions of this print were done in both French and German. Um, there was, uh, and actually, oh, uh, I mean, one of my favorite Fr French images, this is from a French uh, history of the revolution that was published a few years later, actually, in, uh, in 1780, well, still during the war, but in 1782. I love this image, and it's not very well known. They have a copy of it at the Library of Congress, um, but it's, it's, it's unlike the other image of the fire that I showed you, this one is not known. This shows several women being involved I mean, if we look at it carefully, I don't want to leave the mic, but um, if we look carefully, there's one woman holding like three torches. Uh, another one is about to stab herself. This actually like was in a British newspaper account. Another woman is about to stab herself, but a British soldier kind of stops her at the last minute. Um, uh, there's a weeping woman and a child is comforting her. Like, look, I've lost everything. You, you can sort of imagine, right? Uh, w you know, the, w women having re reactions like that. But the idea, you know, that here's a, 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 a soldier grabbing a woman by the hair as she's holding a torch and supposedly setting New York City on fire. Um, so this is an imagined version of this scene, and it's based mostly on British newspaper accounts. Thomas Jefferson actually complained about this book because he thought it was too reliant on British newspaper accounts because, um, you know, Jefferson could read French, etc. But, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, in Europe, they were interested in this war because, of course, the, Britain had very few allies during the Revolutionary War. And most of the other wars of the early modern period, the British could, you know, have an alliance with Prussia, you know, with some of the German states. They they would have buddies whenever they went into one of these, you know, big, you know, global wars. But in the revolution, they were kind of alone. And the idea that the American, like, you know, the British had just taken half, you know, taken over France's claims to North America, right? The Mississippi Valley, 
you, you know, and, and, and Canada was now, had, had now just gotten into British hands. So the British looked like they were kind of really powerful. And so the idea that like the 13 colonies might split off from this empire and weaken the British, that was of great interest to the French and Germans and Dutch uh, and lots of other people in Europe. That's why the French ally themselves with the Americans in 1778. And it's sort of hard to imagine the Americans winning the war uh, if not for French help, because the, the, the French are not only there at Yorktown and, you know, and Lafayette helping Washington out and stuff, but the French were also forcing the British to kind of uh, pay attention to other theaters of war, not just North America. Now the British have to worry about the French in the English Channel. They have to worry about the French in India. They have to worry about the French in the Caribbean, right? That gives them a lot fewer troops with which to pacify the American rebellion. And so without our French buddies, right, we might not be a country. Um, so yeah, interest in um, the outcome of the American Revolution was quite high uh, in, the, in the courts of, of Europe. And you can see that reflected in the newspapers. Although for the most part, their information channels were not excellent. And so often they would have to rely on, on, on newspaper accounts from London. But sometimes, you know, I mean, Benjamin Franklin would, was, you know, he had, a, he had a press when he was stationed in, uh, in uh, in Paris, he would just like print fake newspapers, <laughs> like you, you know, uh, a, a, he, was a, he was a master of propaganda in that way. Um, you know, newspaper issues making the British look bad. Um, um, please wait for the microphone. Yeah, wait for the mic. Uh, otherwise, I have to repeat your question, and I've done a lot of talk. Um, uh, my question is: You've obviously, understandably, spoken a lot of what was going on before the fire, and then in September. Can you talk a little bit about the ramifications as far as the the overall war effort. Yeah, and I'm. I know I'm somewhat familiar from a number of years ago, um, with Washington being up on the hillside and how they even escaped and everything. But what the ramifications were for the long term. Yeah, you can. I mean, you can visit uh, Morris Trumel Mansion, one of the few surviving uh, pre pre revolutionary houses in Manhattan, uh, which is where Washington was headquartered during uh, during the fire. Um, now, the British had planned to attack Paulus Hook, New Jersey, on the left side of this map on September 21st. The fire delays them by about two days. Um, so, as far as immediate effects of the fire, that's really kind of it. the The most important long term effect of the fire, I would say. Um, is uh, it reduces the housing stock in New York City. And so New York City didn't just have to welcome back its own loyalists and house a bunch of troops and officers and auxiliaries uh, and families of soldiers, uh, but also loyalist refugees who were being kicked out of their communities elsewhere in America were flocking to New York and looking for a place to live. And so the crowding conditions uh, throughout the war are really bad for the British. Um, now, I mean, the fire did not burn some of the most commercial and militarily important parts of New York City. Most of the wharfage is on the East River. Um, what was mostly burned was the Customs House, a few very wealthy mansions on Broadway, the Lutheran Church, Trinity Church, uh, uh, and then a bunch of actually working class housing that Trinity Church actually owned that land uh, and people lived, had to build their own houses on those plots of land for 99 year leases. Um, and so it was mostly like humble wooden dwellings that were burned by the fire. What doesn't get burned are the like, you know, the lumber yards and the ship uh, building areas and things like that. That would have really um, harmed the, the British. But in my opinion, not for lack of trying. Um, even though we only see this part as having been burned, there were incendiary materials discovered closer to the East River that might have indicated that the Americans were trying their best to burn that part of the city as well, but the wind was not in their favor, and so the wind only mostly burned this area that was between Broadway and the Hudson River. Um, days delay was significant? Not really, no. Uh, uh, no, because Washington isn't in New Jersey. There was like a, there was like one reg, one or two regiments of troops in Paulus Hook. They fled in advance, and the British established their beachhead in New Jersey. Um, Washington is ensconced up in the uh, the the heights of Harlem and Washington Heights, um, and the British don't manage to dislodge him from there until November. Um, so uh, yeah, as far as the the overall outcome of the war, you know, in terms of military strategy, it doesn't have that big effect. But remember, if this is also considered a war of public opinion. One of the things I argue in the book is that if the British had been better about capitalizing on public opinion of the fire, if they'd been able to capitalize on it and said, look at how, you know, look at the Americans wantonly destroying civilian homes, maybe they could have persuaded more people to be loyalists, um, right? There were plenty of good reasons to be a loyalist in those days, especially in late 1776 when the, when the Continental Army isn't doing so hot. Um, so again, I think you know, this is this is sort of a dog that didn't bark, right? But I think that the the greater effect might have been 
political or in the realms of public opinion, but that's not what happened, um, in part because the Americans were so successful at spinning the story in their own way. Um, one of the things that you don't deal with is the fact that most biographers of Washington and people like Flexner and McCullough, etc., have implied that Washington, even when he retreated from New York City, believed that he would come back to conquer it. And it wasn't until 1780 and Rochambeau came uh, to America and convinced him that the war would be won in the South, that he finally gave up the illusory concept that he would be able to reconquer New York, which was his ultimate goal. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I do talk about that a little bit in the book. To me, that's not necessarily an indicator that Washington wanted New York City intact no matter what. I think it's that he escaped from New York. If we believe that he tried to burn it, right, he wasn't successful. So he knows that part of New York is intact and that the British are taking advantage of it. And so for him to take New York back would both kind of correct a wrong, you know, uh, of him having lost New York in 1776 and also deprived the British of the value that they were deriving from an intact New York City. Um, so, I mean, uh, so I do kind of mention that, that it, it may, maybe a little bit too cursorily in the book. Uh, and I didn't, you're right, mention it in the talk. Um, but to me, the fact that Washington really wanted to take New York back after September 1776 is not necessarily an indicator that he always wanted to preserve it. I mean, the, the reason, I mean, in my opinion, the reason why most biographers of Washington are unwilling to say that he did it is because if you read 19th century biographies of Washington or treatments of Washington in broader histories of the Revolutionary War, they, they are mostly very, as you could imagine, laudatory of Washington. And there are many reasons, of course, to admire Washington, his deference to civilian authority, his willingness to put down the sword and give up power when he could have been like Caesar or Cromwell, right? Like there's so many reasons why we ought to admire Washington anyway, right? I'm not trying to say that. Um, uh, but and, and so for that reason, right, if a historian had the choice to kind of be like, yeah, but there's this little black mark, he might have burned New York City. If they, if they have a choice of whether to say that or not, I think they're probably not going to say that. And interestingly, even British histories of the revolution by the late 19th century were like, you know what? We admire this guy Washington so much because a lot of British people did admire Washington during the Revolutionary War. We admire this guy so much. We don't think he was involved either uh, anymore. And, you know, this is a hundred years later, but still, uh, Whig histori British historians, Tory British historians, you can find the, those that also um, are willing to exonerate Washington. But every 20 years or so, you see an exception um, where some historian, you know, maybe a veteran of the Civil War, uh, the American Civil War will say, you know what? I bet the Americans did do it. And like, they should have. The British had burned a bunch of cities. This was considered an accepted tactic during war. Why aren't we just owning up to this? You know, uh, but for the most part, that's not what historians are doing. Historians are like, oh no, Washington asked for, you know, Congress permission. And there's, you know, there's no way he could have done it. And I think just not taking the possibility seriously enough. And so this book is not necessarily saying Washington definitely did it because I don't think the evidence is there to support it. But it is saying, let's at least acknowledge the possibility that he might have. Um, and then look, I'm hoping that this book will be kind of a bat signal for other historians toiling away in the archives. Maybe they'll discover some account of the fire that I haven't uh, that will make um, a, a more direct link to uh, you know, Washington's chain of command. Right now, I'm happy to say uh, uh, that I don't know for sure. Um, however, I do think the evidence is more suggestive than historians like McCullough and Flexner uh, might have been willing to admit. I'm curious whether uh, in 1778, when the sort of tables are turned and the British are abandoning Philadelphia to the Continental Army, um, I don't know if this is sort of part of what you've researched, if there's any evidence that they ever considered burning down that city, it was sort of being the patriot equivalent of loyalist New York. Yeah, um, so th th this is, I keep getting asked this by this, um, uh, by, uh, I think it's Robert Wong who runs the American Revolution Roundtable in New Jersey. He's come to a couple of talks and he keeps asking me about these other cities. And the, 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 the part of it that bugs me is in the last chapter of my dissertation, which didn't make it into the book, I actually talk about the occupation of, uh, of all the cities and the, the threats to burn all of them because all of them have either actual fires or fire scares. Um, like Charleston, Charleston, South Carolina, 
uh, a few days after the British occupy it, a powder magazine explodes, um, you, you know, and uh, and actually kills a bunch of people. Um, uh, so again, one of these things where like the Americans give up a town and then all of a sudden some kind of disaster happens. Um, so uh, yeah, there were definitely rumors of one side or the other burning Philadelphia in 1778, um, but this wasn't something that happened. Um, uh, there were rumors that the British were gonna come in and bombard it as early as 1776. Congress gets uh, pretty panicked about that at one point. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, there's nothing on the scale of something like this of the, uh, I think the Americans either had learned their lesson or knew well enough, like, hey, if we burn the city where Congress meets, that's really, I mean, it was bad enough that they had to flee and meet in places like York, Pennsylvania, but if they had actually like burned Philadelphia behind them, that probably would have been like, all right, you guys are just wilderness guerrillas now. Like, you, you know what I mean? I mean, but the Americans fantasize about this. Charles Royster points this out in the revolutionary people at war, like that there's all these fantasies from 1775 onward, like, who needs cities? Cities are places of vice and corruption, and there's lots of loyalists there. We don't need cities. We'll just, as long as we can flee to the woods, you know, uh, the Americans will be okay. You know, the cities are vulnerable to the British Navy. Let's let's just write them off. You know, um, Franklin would talk that way sometimes. A lot of you know, a lot of Americans were um, prone to talking that way at times. The question I have is um, great book about Lexington and Concord by um, Walter Boreham and called American Spring. And in it, he mentions right after the battle, the Americans spring into action. They write their narrative. They disperse post writers at record speed to get the story printed. They find the fastest ship they can to get it over to England to influence the story there. And by the time the British military has finished doing their after action, they find the slowest barge they can to send the story to London. And the story is a done deal. Do you see anything similar in this case where there's an incident that can be used for political, you know, means of war? I, I, I think it was just a long-standing habit by then. I mean, you know, because they, you know, they, they had learned how to use the press, um, you, you know, to rally people to their side, you know, from the Stamp Act crisis onward in 1765. So, you know, so to me, I see this, uh, I, I think of this book as a military history, but I also think of it as blending in with some of the um, work on pre-revolutionary politics that I had done in my previous books, right? Like to me, it's maybe the last gasp of like the politically radical, you know, part period of 1765 to 17, 1775 uh, that happens to overlap with the war years of 1775 to 1783. Um, so, uh, and a key part of that, right, was using the press to get the to get your side of the story out. And so, yeah, you can see all sorts of examples of that. I think it was a continuous process, not a, aha, here's another incident that we can make hay of. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a number of good books that you can read on uh, how Americans used the discourse, uh, both to rally their allies in America and in Europe and in Britain, um, and also try and discredit the other side. Um, we'll do one more. Can, is there any association, you say the, most people today don't know about the fire, but everyone knows about Nathan Hale. Can Yeah, well, it's, it's for, yeah, for, so to me, right, oh, I have a slide of Nathan Hale, actually, so, uh, or, and, and, or actually, it's John Andre, I think. Um, yeah, to me, you know, Nathan Hale was very lucky in that he had some, um, yeah, these are pictures of Major John Andre. Um, he was very lucky in that he had his friends from Yale College who, you know, who really admired him and kind of kept telling his story. Uh, you know, even though, you know, Nathan Hale's uh, career as a spy was very brief, and even though he was hanged the day after the fire on September 22nd, 1776, it's not clear that the work that he was doing had anything to do with the fire, that he was actually just out there uh, trying to gather intelligence for, for Washington. And then he was caught out of uniform and he confessed to being a spy. And so that was why he was hanged. Some historians have suggested maybe he was the New England captain uh, uh, you know, that was mentioned in British newspaper accounts. Uh, other historians have speculated that Hale became a scapegoat for the fire, that the ru ruins are still smoldering. And they're like, oh, we've got a spy in our hands. Let's Let's, you know, let's take this out on him and execute him. But I think that the story of Abraham Patton is more interesting. I mean, Patton, you can see it, it, Washington talking to him, William Heath talking to him. He was traveling back and forth between British occupied New York and New Jersey, you know, passing intelligence along to Washington. Um, he actually ends up talking to American POWs in the city. And, it, you, you know, uh, and Alexander Graydon is like, this guy was like a little bit indiscreet and unburdening himself. He like runs into a friend from Baltimore and he's like, hey, I'm an American spy hanging out here in British occupied New York City. So, uh, uh, you know, I describe him. He has this amazing career. He lived in the Carolinas. He lived in Pennsylvania he lived before the war, he lived in Baltimore. I 
describe him as um, uh, reckless and ruthless um, uh, 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 and, and rootless because he, he, wa he wandered around so much. Um, so I think Abraham Patton deserves to be at least as famous as, um, as Nathan Hale. Uh, and I've tried to try, uh, what's interesting is he, he appears in no military records. The only thing that suggests he was actually a captain were newspapers that say, you know, where they have lists of people who had mail waiting for them at the post office. And it said, Captain Abraham Patton. But I can't find him in any, as captain of any Maryland regiments or Pennsylvania regiments or any of the other states, uh, that, you know, where he might have been serving as an American officer. So he was apparently under deep cover, uh, except for this, uh, this newspaper account. But fascinating uh, figure. He, 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 um, he probably grew up near where Andrew Jackson did. Uh, in the Waxhaws, um, but he owned property in Pennsylvania, and then he becomes part of the Scots-Irish uh, patriot community of Baltimore um, and lives there for a few years, and then the war starts, and this is what he does. Um, and he leaves behind uh, a wife and four children, but I'm not really sure what happened to them either, except that I've, you know, I've seen the, the baptism records for the three daughters. Um, Let's give a big round of applause. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Karp will be available. He'll be seated up here at the front to sign your books, which are available for sale out in the hall. And thank you all for being here tonight.